What would it mean for humankind if we could control the climate? We might know soon enough because scientists around the world are figuring out how we can use geoengineering technology to control sunshine and rain. That could mean the end of small talk about the weather. But if we could take the technology far enough, it could also mean the end of our climate change pickle. Give that some thought while we follow our connections journey to a future of weather and climate manipulation. Starting this time here in Virginia, 1842, with George Latimer and his young wife, Rebecca. They are enslaved people living under a nasty and abusive enslaver called James B. Gray. Rebecca is pregnant, and they cannot bear the thought of bringing a child into a world of slavery and suffering. So they hatch an escape plan. They board a ship bound for Boston, hiding beneath the deck. Later, George says, as we lay concealed in the darkness, we could peek through the cracks of the partition into the bar room of the vessel, where men who would have gladly captured us were drinking. On October 7th, 1842, their ship docks in Boston, where slavery is banned. Here, they can live as husband and wife. Here, their baby will be born free. Here, for the first time, George and Rebecca feel hope for their future. But then George is spotted by a friend of James Gray and is arrested. He's quite literally accused of stealing himself since he's still Gray's property under Virginia law. James Gray demands the state of Massachusetts return George to him, but local abolitionists in Boston catch wind of George's arrest and begin to call for his freedom. They know that the outcome of this case could greatly affect their cause. So they help George to win. And in 1855, Massachusetts agrees to abolitionists' demands by passing the Latimer Laws, which declare that state officials could never again take part in the recapture of a fugitive slave. Within a few years, almost every other northern state has followed suit. George and Rebecca Latimer are finally able to live and raise their children as free people. And those free children go on to do incredible things, especially George and Rebecca's fourth and youngest child, Louis. By the time he's 26, Louis Howard Latimer is a successful inventor. In 1874, he invents a toilet system for railroad cars called a water closet, which is a nice way of putting it. And beginning in 1876, he works as Alexander Graham Bell's assistant, helping him to file his patent for the telephone. Then in 1879, Thomas Edison invents the light bulb. But Edison's light bulb uses a carbonized bamboo filament, which burns out quickly. So it isn't all that practical. But Lewis has a bright idea to make the carbon filament more durable by encasing it in cardboard. And in 1882, he patents his new process. His invention greatly improves Edison's light bulb, making incandescent lighting practical and affordable. Thomas Edison takes notice. He can see that Louis Latimer is brilliant. So in 1884, he offers him a job at the Edison Electric Light Company. For the next four decades, he makes some huge contributions to Edison's company. He literally writes the book on electric lighting, the first to formalize Edison's work on light bulbs. He supervises the installation of public electric lights across the United States. And in 1918, he's made a member of Edison's elite research team, the Edison Pioneers. He is the first person of color to be invited to the group. Thanks to the work of people like Lewis Howard Latimer, the Edison Electric Light Company thrives. It merges with several other companies and in 1892 becomes General Electric. In 1909, the General Electric Research Laboratories hire a young man named Irving Langmuir. Just like Lewis Howard Latimer, Langmuir makes his name in light. A general electric three-way bulb. And his work on filaments in gases leads directly to the invention of the gas-filled incandescent lamp. But in the 1940s, his scientific interests turn to the weather. 
While still working at the General Electric Research Laboratories, Langmuir conducts a crazy experiment. In 1946, at the Schenectady Airport in New York, he stands on the ground as his presumably braver assistant, Vincent Schaefer, leans out the window of a small prop plane and tosses pellets of dry ice into a cloud. Seconds later, the cloud begins to writhe and churn, and within minutes, it's disappeared and transformed into rain. And before Schaefer has even had time to land, Langmuir races off to telephone a reporter, and he shouts into the receiver, mankind has finally learned to control the weather. Langmuir and Schaefer have just invented something called cloud seeding. So clouds can't just form in a vacuum in empty space. Just like the water that condenses on your windows when it's cold, water vapor in the atmosphere needs something to condense on. That something is cloud condensation nuclei. It's a big term for small particulates in the atmosphere. Usually things like sea salt or carbon from fires or volcanic ash. If there are more of these particles, then there are more places for water to condense, which means more water in the cloud and an increased chance of rainfall. Langmuir and Schaefer's experiment works because it introduces more of these particles, in their case, dry ice, into the cloud. From this point on, the world goes cloud seeding mad. In the 1960s, the US government launched Project Storm Fury in which they try and fail to use cloud seeding to control hurricanes. At the 2008 Beijing Olympics, the Chinese government carries out a multi-million dollar cloud seeding program to prevent downpours at the opening ceremony by encouraging rain clouds to form elsewhere. In 2015, one luxury holiday company even offered a cloud bursting service with a 100% guarantee of fair weather and clear skies for your wedding day. Just for the small price of $125,000, because with enough science and money, nothing can rain on your parade. And today, as the world warms, over 50 countries have adopted cloud seeding programs to help with the impacts of climate change. Eight U.S. states now have cloud seeding programs to help them keep crops watered in times of drought. And in 2020 and 2021, Russian firefighters seeded clouds to bring rain down over wildfires raging in Siberia. But the thing is, cloud seeding projects are always a bit of a gamble. To be successful, they have to happen at the right air temperature, the right humidity, and with the correct size material to allow condensation to form on the particle. So you never really know if cloud seeding is gonna work or how much rain you will get. And that's where this genius woman, Dr. Linda Zhao, comes in. And she's leading a groundbreaking, I guess, or sky-shaping project at the Khalifa University of Science and Technology using nanotechnology to develop cloud seeding materials. Nanotechnology allows her to design the materials that are sprayed into clouds with well-controlled particle size and shapes and properties. So in theory, it could give us much greater control over rain production. And that could save us from a future of crop and water shortages in times of drought. Cloud seeding demonstrated for the first time that humanity has the ability to manipulate environmental processes using geoengineering in a way that could help us to mitigate the effects of climate change. But mm, what if we went further than just mitigation? What if we actually tried to stop climate change in its tracks? Well, there are already scientists all around the world researching ways that we could engineer our climate to cool the Earth down, from adding iron to the ocean, to spraying reflective particles into the atmosphere, to launching literal mirrors into space. 
The Harvard Center for Solar Geoengineering is leading the first ever trial of using aerosol particles to reflect the sun's beams and cool the Earth's surface, funded by none other than Bill Gates. But indigenous Sami people in Norway, where the trial is being conducted, have raised concerns. They believe that blocking out the sun with reflective particles to cool the earth is the kind of thinking that produced the climate crisis in the first place. And perhaps there is something in this. Are we playing God if we alter our earth's climate in this way? Could we go too far? Interfere too much? Do we really know what we're doing? Or are we just scrambling for a quick fix in the face of the climate crisis.